a bit more high level than Sasha is, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the traditional art world is using blockchain right now um, and some of the ways that we are using it. Um, as, um, as was mentioned, I founded Code I was a co-founder of Codex Protocol in 2017. Um, I currently work with Creative United and um, the Arts Council England looking at the impacts of technology on the UK contemporary art market. That's a report that's coming out at the end of this year in light of the political instability that we're all going through, um, how the, the UK's art market is really going to be affected. And I founded um, the Foundation for Art and Blockchain in 2018. Um, it's a US 501c3, which um, aims to support artists who are working at the intersection of art and technology. Um, we did a big launch uh, last year where we sold a crypto kitty for $140,000 in an auction. And that was very exciting. But since then, we funded art projects, um, including one that's going to the Vancouver Biennale next year, which is going to be a four day installation at the Biennale. Um, and so really working within the traditional world to help use art as a medium to explain blockchain. Um, and I'm going to show you some fun pieces of art to keep you awake as we go through. Um, in 2016, I started writing an academic paper on the applications of blockchain for the art world. That was at Sotheby's Institute of Art. My background before that was in finance, but I was working at Sotheby's. Um, and had already, had, was already interested in crypto through some friends um, and noticed the intersection of this technology and the traditional art world with some familiar names like Deloitte who were looking at how blockchains could be used to track provenance um, and many unfamiliar names as well who are either um, galleries like Cointemporary who are specializing in blockchain related artworks, the moving picture gallery uh, and a few others. And so that was in 2007, probably this picture is about 2017, and this is what it looks like today. It's enormous. Um, and you can see that there's a huge range of the various use cases for this technology within the traditional kind of art world sphere. Um, title and provenance is what I would call the kind of infrastructure layer. Um, a lot of people, a lot of projects working on that right now to give us the grounding to do much more exciting things um, like securitization or fractionalization. You can own now a 1% of, of a Warhol, um, allowing artists to secure their intellectual property. Um, and of course, artists um, using cryptocurrency either as payment mechanism, um, if you want to buy Vase's art with some Bitcoin, or indeed issuing their own coin in various ways, shapes, or forms, um, either as artwork or indeed as a, as a payment mechanism too. And so lots and lots of things um, that have been evolving over the last um, several years. This was a survey done of art world um, auction houses and galleries in 2017, so quite a long time ago now. Um, and there is a new one coming out this year, which everybody is eager to see. Uh, whether the expectations have dropped or increased. But even then, a lot of auction houses were thinking about how this was going to impact their business um, and really thinking about how, um, you know, how they were going to evolve. And one of the reasons for that is that when the internet came about, many, many art world institutions got caught out. Um, they thought it was not going to impact them. Um, some, art, some online art platforms came and the last 10 years, a lot of big institutions within the art world have been scrambling these very, very good digital teams, not only to catch up on some of the things that they perhaps missed out on, but also to make sure that they are taking advantage of future technologies. And so um, even some of the most traditional art world players, Christie's of this world, um, have been running crypto uh, blockchain conferences um, and writing sort of very in-depth research reports about the impact of this technology um, on the market. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the art, which is kind of the fun bit, um, and then a little bit more about how this is being used actively today um, within the art world. So these are some of the fun things. You might have seen some of them before. Um, this one is one of my favorites. You probably can't see from the back, but this is a picture of um, Nakamoto um, by an artist called Crypto Graffiti. And if you look very closely, these are cut up JP Morgan credit cards. Um, and Risk, which was um, a, a kind of board game visual display done by an artist called Simon Denny at the Petzl Gallery in New York in 2016. Um, very different, again, a real focus and commentary on the culture of cryptocurrency and blockchain. 
um, which is a bit like this one. Um, the Bitcoin, which was developed by Sarah Miohas in 2015, she actually issued her own coin, um, distributed them to collectors and potential collectors. And if you collect enough Bitcoins, you can redeem them for one of her physical uh, works of art, although these are actually um, fairly in demand as well to actually have um, one of the original Bitcoins. Again, a slight commentary on the um, composition of the crypto and blockchain um, culture, particularly in 2015, um, if not still today. Um, some more kind of fun pieces. This has sort of been, I think, particularly exciting for people over the last sort of crypto winter um, and, a, and a great reminder. Um, and, and these, which are watercolours done by a Scottish artist called Terry Cook, um, who was commissioned by um, one of the early Ethereum guys to paint um, a very similar one to this um, and has been producing um, kind of interesting works ever since. Um, this book I highly recommend if for anybody who is in the blockchain space, not just artists and not just people who are interested in art. Um, it's a, a work of art in and of itself. Um, each chapter, um, you, can, you have an app and you can allocate um, theoretical cryptocurrencies to each chapter. Um, those theoretical cryptocurrencies are invested using na um, natural language processing according to the content of the chapter. Um, and you can watch your portfolio change over time. Um, and it is a real, um, it's really insightful in terms of bringing artistic thinking and very, very left field thinking into the ecosystem about the potential impact that this technology is having and could have on wider society. Um, it, it contains a piece of art called this, um, the Nakamoto Oath, which is a sort of proposed oath for developers about how they should be creating this technology um, with everybody in mind, um, and, and a, a, a fantastic book. Um, this is um, the final piece of art that I'll show you, which is um, I Am A Coin um, by an artist called Kevin Abosh. He sort of comes from the traditional world. And in 2017, this was done, um, he had his wife, who is a doctor, um, draw his blood. And using his blood, he stamped um, the smart contract address of a contract which released 10,000 um, ERC20 tokens. He called them I am a coin. The idea was that he had sort of given life to them. And he uses them in a whole series of works, including one of my favorite, which is um, called Stealing the Wallet. The contents of this wallet is a crime. Um, and he releases actually the, both the public and the private address. Um, and the follow on works from that are called This is a Crime Scene, um, as he monitors the wallets that these coins end up in. And it's really fascinating to see people take one, give it back, send it to somebody else as a gift. Um, and as a sort of sort of conceptual piece of art is, is really interesting, particularly, I think, in terms of thinking about how we place value on art and artists. Um, and he collaborated with Ai Weiwei last year to release um, another project called Priceless, um, which, again, is a real commentary on value and the value that we place as society on people. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about this because I'm going to, this is where we begin to touch on digital art. Um, this is very obvious which one the Mona Lisa is, not just because she's behind some bulletproof glass in the Louvre, um, but we recognise which the original is versus replicated images. Whereas within the digital art sphere, we traditionally haven't been able to do that. Um, this is what Sasha was talking about earlier. Um, we don't know which the original JPEG is. But imagine if we could allow collectors to recognize the unique, the digital, and scarcity is something that's very, very important in terms of value construction of art. Um, and so if we can prove which is the unique, um, the individual, that allows us to enable free image replication of, of digital works while still having the concept of being able to collect the edition or the single edition or, or uh, any number of editions. And the implication of that, as we've seen, is um, crypto kitties selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but also of a number of platforms focused on enabling digital artists to um, not only protect their intellectual property, but also to monetize it. Um, one of the most interesting ones, and again, Sasha talked about this idea of resale royalties, which is something that is much closer to our hearts here in, um, in Europe than it is in the US. But a platform called Dada, um, which has restricted trading of tokens so that secondary trades have to go through the platform. But that allows um, the, uh, a fraction of the resale royalties to be given back to the artist. Um, and the reason that this is so important that a lot of people miss out on is that 
value construction within the art world is about the longevity and the life cycle of an artist's career. If I produce the work today and I sell it to you for $100 and then I go become an accountant, the likelihood of that work is ever becoming worth millions of dollars is very, very small. And so um, value increases for art are highly dependent on the continued activity of that artist um, and the continued work, which is why I think that um, many people would agree that artists um, should be able to participate in the upside of those works. Um, and, oh, I've lost the slide that does it, but there is a really great academic in the US who is working on not this concept of royalties, but of fractional ownership such that an artist can retain an equity stake in a work of art that they own and choose to trade that at any point in time or monetize that at some point so that they can um, realize the future value of their career. Um, they do this in a very economic and, and statistical sort of um, setting and model what it would be like if, if top 20 artists retained a percentage of their work rather than investing the, the profits from their work into the S&P um, and, and then look at how that can be modeled across all artists. And it's really, really interesting in terms of how we are projecting value through the ecosystem to the, some of the people who create it, but who today often don't get to participate in that value. So what about the more kind of traditional art world? Um, the first transaction from an institution in the art world to buy a piece of art for cryptocurrency was in 2015. It was the um, Applied Museum of Contemporary Art in, um, in Austria. And they, they bought Han van der Doppel's Event Listeners, which is a digital piece of art for Bitcoin. Um, and since then, the use of um, cryptocurrency as a um, payment mechanism within the art world is growing. Um, there are galleries like Coin Temporary, which only accepts um, cryptocurrency. Um, and even more <coughs> traditional work, so we do a lot of work um, with a company called Live Auctioneers who provide white label software. Um, they now have the, the, the ability to accept Ethereum as, as payments. And the reason that that is attractive is often because the art world is very global. Um, big cross-border transactions, exchange rate fees, um, all sorts of things. And so the, the idea of being able to buy things with cryptocurrency is sort of slowly making its way throughout the art world. Fractional ownership, of course, is a big hot topic. Um, last year, a company called Mycenas um, auctioned 49% of an Andy Warhol electric chair. Um, for, which kind of gave a total market cap, I suppose, of that artwork of about $5.6 million. And you can now trade that um, on, uh, on the Mycenas exchange. Personally, I'm a little skeptical on this one because um, it's been tried before in centralized circumstances and where you have a physical piece of art, you also need some sort of centralization who's going to hold that physical piece of art. And the demand um, historically hasn't been super high. So I think it'll be really interesting to see whether blockchain um, and, and this idea of fractionalization um, can reinvigorate that demand for fractional shares of work. And finally, I'm going to talk about provenance, which is, I think, as I said earlier, some of the kind of infrastructure level stuff that is being built for the art world today. Um, for those of you who don't know, provenance is probably the primary value driver of, of works in works in the art world. This is a very extreme example, but should tell you the story. Um, this, this painting here is um, believed to be by Jackson Pollock. Um, it was sold in 2006 at Sotheby's for $140 million. And the reason it was sold for that is because there's very low risk associated with it. We know the five collectors who've owned it. We've got pictures of that first collector standing in Jackson Pollock's studio with Jackson Pollock and the painting. Um, so the chances that that is fake are low. The chances that somebody else has claimed to the title are very low. Um, on the other hand, we have this one, which the paint samples test the same. Um, anybody who's seen the um, documentary Who the Fuck is Jackson Pollock will know this story, but this was found in a garage. Um, nobody knows where it came from, or, and most Warhol experts think it probably is by him, but nobody is going to pay any amount of money for it um, because the risk is so high that it is not real, that somebody doesn't have good title to it, that there is some sort of outstanding claim, bad restoration, all sorts of different things. And so this is what we talk about when we talk about provenance. It's the history of the item, and particularly the documentation that goes with that. Um, you may or may not know these artists. This is a piece by Rothko. Uh, this is another Jackson Pollock. This is a Monet. Um, but none of them are. 
And the only reason that we know none of them are is because we spotted the fakes in the documentation. Um, the artworks went totally under the radar by experts and museums, um, and the forger who did them, Beltracchi, is an Austrian guy, um, and we know that there are a lot of his works still in the museums around us today. Um, this picture looks like it was taken um, a very long time ago, but it wasn't. This is his wife dressed as a Victorian lady, posing as an Austrian heiress with the pictures on the wall. Um, the idea being that they went to these auction houses and they said, hey, we've got proof that this, these belonged to my wife. Um, you can see these certificates of authenticity that we've got. They faked all of this stuff, and they even um, managed to sneak some of this documentation into the Tate archives, um, and who knows where else around the world. And this is the main issue here. It is not that people um, are regularly um, creating long-lost long uh, Mona Lisas or replicas of the Mona Lisa. It is that they are creating forged documentation. Um, even for real artworks, um, the prevalence of forged documentations is very, very high because people know that good provenance supports a higher price. Um, and this is where the work that we'd, we've been doing at Codex comes in, is the idea of being able to um, store provenance information, that documentation, um, on an NFT over time. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is that we, it's very difficult when you're talking about an offline asset to validate information that is added uh, to the blockchain. The way that that's done in the art world today is that we have reputation systems. We trust particular players. That's why I go to X auction house and I'm happy to spend a million pounds. I'm not because I don't have it. But if I did, I would go to X auction house. I probably wouldn't go to Uncle Bob's auction house around the corner and spend a million pounds because I'm not quite convinced that Uncle Bob has the same reputation. And so what we have done at Codex is replicate that through a system of verified accounts, um, a bit like the blue check mark on Twitter. Um, if you have been through a verification process, we know who you are as a consortium, um, then you can have a check mark. If you haven't and you're just a collector, then you have um, your, your wallet address. And what that means is that collectors can store documentation over time, um, but when they come to sell a work, um, they know which pieces of information have come from which sources and at which point in time. And that's the really critical thing here when we talk about the documentation issue, um, is that we know that that photograph wasn't taken 100 years ago. It was actually only uploaded to the blockchain yesterday, and it wasn't uploaded to the blockchain um, by a reputable source with a blue check mark. It came from somebody that we don't know. And so we are better able to evaluate the validity of that information. Um, and so sort of talking about a little bit what have we've done about Codex, here we go, this is that painting <laughs> at the back. Um, this is Vaser's gallery um, on the Codex platform. Um, artists are able to document and register their work. Vaser has a blue tick mark um, and can register these. And what he can then do, oh, this, sorry, I'm going to skip it. This is an auction house um, page. Um, but what he can then do is actually send that record via email. So we've built um, basically a smart contract that custodies NFTs that you can access via um, OAuth login and um, various other login functionalities, which um, there are kind of purists who think that that's not very decentralized. Why use a Gmail login to access this? But the reality is that um, in terms of driving adoption within what is a very traditional art world, um, if you can email a certificate of authenticity or a codex record to your collector, um, I guarantee you they are much more likely to be able to use it and to interact with it and to even just start learning about this stuff um, than they are if you tell them, um, you know, my mum, when she buys a piece of art at a gallery, that now she has to go home and download MetaMask. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so, so this is something um, that we've been really focused on, um, working with the traditional art world to develop user experiences that, um, sure, bridge that gap somewhere between centralization and decentralization, but really start to engage people with how this stuff can impact them. Um, and you can log in with MetaMask if you want. Um, 
this, uh, this is um, a little bit about the limitations. I think um, one of the things that is really important is to distinguish what blockchain can and can't do. And this is a little bit more relevant when I talk to an art world audience who often um, either have been promised that blockchain is the solution to everything um, or who are very, very skeptical about it. But the key thing I think is really here around the documentation. We can prove where information comes from um, and, and at what time that information is added to the blockchain. Um, and that is a huge improvement on the status quo. Uh, and I'm going to finish with um, this quote from an artist friend of mine, Benton C. Bainbridge, who says that if you made a symbiotic union between digital money and digital art, would the two forms mutually reinforce one another? And his belief was, yes, it would. And my belief is that too, because I think there are a number of artists Phaser included, who are doing tremendous work to help um, push the blockchain um, and crypto um, and, and all of this stuff out to the wider world and to help people understand it. Um, and at the same time, I really hope this stuff can benefit artists as well. That's it. No questions. Everyone's ready for a pint. Oh, no, there was one at the back. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there are num there are a number of ways of doing it. Um, at Codex, we have a partnership with a company based here in the UK called TagSmart, who produce synthetic DNA tags, um, different kinds of tags, whether it's paper or canvas or a sculpture. Um, but those effectively can be read, and the identity of that synthetic DNA can be added to a Codex record. Um, we also work with a company called Dust. Um, which is based out of the US. They use kind of tiny, tiny little pieces of diamond who all have their own identity that's unique and readable. Um, and that can be added onto the back of a canvas or something like that. It's very hard to remove. Um, there are also extremely innovative things happening. There's a company called Proveneer Authentication in the US who is producing canvas with synthetic DNA already embedded within it. Um, so there are, there are kind of a huge number of these sort of technological solutions which are bridging that gap. One of the issues, of course, is the integrity of the artwork. Um, and there are many artists who either don't want some sort of tag on their work or who feel that that compromises the integrity of the work. Um, and that's where solutions like scanning um, become really interesting. And, and also for works that are too um, either fragile or in a state where you can't attach something physically. Um, and there are a number of companies around who will do um, very, very detailed carbon analysis and um, 3D scanning and x-rays and produce um, basically that a sort of set of data. Um, and there is one who I, I don't think the, um, the integration is complete from a technical perspective, but who will eventually, they're based in Vancouver. Um, they're some of the sort of top ones in the world. And they will be able to write directly to the Codex blockchain to say, you know, this is, this, we can prove that this is the first scan. Um, so that if ever there was dispute, they would be able to redo that and, and effectively match that. Um, and other, other challenges exist there, obviously, because work can degrade over time, things change. Um, but within kind of statistical um, reasonability, we think that that probably holds um, over a certain period of time. Um, so there's lots of ways of, of kind of making that link. Um, and they really vary according to cost, how, how valuable it is to do that. Um, I would also say that whilst um, a lot of people think about how do we make this link between physical and digital, Right now, we don't link our paper receipts and our exhibition records in a physical way to the artwork. Um, they are kept together because they mutually reinforce one another's value. Um, and so our sort of the expectation, um, although still to be tested, it's very early days, is that people will want to keep provenance records with the original piece of artwork um, because there's very little incentive to separate them um, in the first place. But, but there are solutions to do that. Yeah, you know, and I think this is where um, one of the points about kind of limitations were is this idea of legal ownership. Um, 
there are you know great companies like Materium doing awesome work on kind of legal recognition of, of this stuff. Um, there was a court case in China about 17 months, 18 months ago, um, where a blockchain record was admissible as a piece of kind of legal ownership proof. Um, I think that that's something that fits in the um, kind of broader realm of, of blockchain, of how legal systems recognize um, blockchain records. And of course, in a sort of case law, um, you know, legal system that's very, very different to um, a, a legislative body. And so I think we will see over time how different legal systems are, are adopting this stuff. Um, I think it's what we've always kind of thought about at Codex is that this should be a tool to help preserve provenance information. Um, it should be a tool to help um, artists document and archive their work. Um, it's not necessarily meant to replace um, you know, anything else, but indeed in the art world you typically don't have um, any sort of legal piece of paper that says you own it either. Um, possession is normally what dictates that, so I think that'll, that'll continue. Um, I have a question, sir. Yeah. So at the moment, it's built on Ethereum, um, and that's how we built it from the start. The way we had two, um, our two earliest investors were two companies called Live Auctioneers and Auction Mobility, who build white label software for auction houses. Um, and so they are our primary customers, and um, I think I sort of skipped over it, but they have auction house pages, um, and through an API can automatically create codex records through their existing software. Um, and so Codex was sort of born out of this idea of providing this technology specifically to auction houses in the first place. Um, there is a lot of discussion, particularly amongst those auction houses and some other kind of key players within the ecosystem about this idea of a permission chain. Um, and part of the issue with that is that there has to be some sort of data standard kind of across different people. Um, the Getty Museum, who I do some work with around their open data platform and how we, um, the nomenclature and the taxonomy we use to describe these things and how they fit in the context of technology is still um, evolving and evolving slowly. Um, and so I think that there is, um, there is certainly belief that um, a sort of an art world permissioned um, chain is a kind of aspiration, um, but I think that for the time being it's still pretty early days. I mean, Codex is just one of several platforms that are around um, trying to do this stuff or different things, and so I think it's, um, you know, for the art world they're really c trying to get to grips with what this means, um, but the likelihood is that there will, I, I think, um, probably end up being a, a sort of industry chain at some point. You say again? At that point, you have to yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, this is still, um, still sort of pretty experimental stuff. Codex now has um, several thousand records on it, and so there would be a kind of migration um, pain. But there are, there's a similar platform called Verisart, which is built actually on top of the Bitcoin um, network. There is Artery, which is built on a permissioned um, Ethereum chain. Um, and, and so I, I suspect at some point there will be a kind of reconciliation um, or maybe we'll get to the stage where they can all talk to each other anyway. Yeah, we've always been built on Ethereum. Um, that is a good question. So, um, so yeah, so I was involved with obviously Codex at, at its outset, and then I founded a company called Shios, which is an EOS block producer. Um, we use our profits to fund girls' coding programs in developing countries. Um, and most recently, I've become involved um, and, and become a co founder, although I'm late to the party, um, of a sort of esports platform called Edge. Um, and so, yeah, I sort of have, have these three things. I mean, I think for me, um, I, I really enjoy solving problems um, and finding um, real problems where um, this technology isn't kind of being 
um, you know, when you've got a hammer, you're always looking for a nail. Um, and whilst I love blockchain, I'm more interested in solving problems in the right way um, and solving problems that I think are really exciting. And so one of the reasons that I love working in the art world is because I have a lot of friends who are artists and it's something that I feel very, very passionately about. Um, for the same reason that working um, with Edge on esports, I find it exciting, it's slightly different. I don't have lots of friends who are esports players, um, but I do recognize that it's a super exciting industry. And so my only recommendation would be to find something that you, um, you know, really love doing and that you feel excited about because founding a company is probably, <laughs> you don't do it for fun um, and you don't do it for money normally um, because, you know, it's, it's a lot of sleepless nights and, a, and an awful lot of heartache and, and work. Um, but if you're doing it for something that you really love, then it makes getting out of bed easy. So what we don't do at Codex is look at individual documentation and verify it. Um, that would be hugely intensive. And typically, it is only done today at the point of sale. That's why you go to an auction house as an expert um, who can tell you whether something is real or not um, and can evaluate that information. I mean, that's why we replicate that same system with this kind of verified blue check marks. There are, of course, technologies that are around that do that. Um, and some of the big auction houses are acquiring these companies, um, which use very artificial intelligence or um, sort of sample testing all sorts of things to see if, if things are real or not um, the you know the thing is that there are there are about two trillion dollars worth of artworks around the world um, only about 64 billion of those um, changes hands every year so it's quite low turnover um, and it's fairly sporadic actually though that turnover tends to be often in the same sort of pool there's stuff that has been sitting in vaults um, often in Switzerland um, for for, hundred, for many many years and we, we never see it and we probably never will um, and so you know I think a lot of this stuff a lot of the documentation that we will see a lot of things that um, may or may not get recorded on a blockchain typically will take place at the point of transaction um, rather than you know adding something that's never left Switzerland never left a vault in Switzerland um, to a blockchain so so I think it's typically transactional and then you normally have an expert that's involved <laughs>